Uh, welcome, uh, everyone, uh, to uh, another lunchtime talk at the Hanaran Center. Uh, I'm very excited today to have Lori Marceau here, who's an old friend and colleague from many years. Uh, she teaches up at uh, Union College, where she's the Director of Women's and Gender Studies and a Professor of Political Theory. Um, she's taught here before uh, at Bard. Uh, uh, a couple years ago on, 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 on Sarah Palin and other things. Oh, and at the Lying in Politics. And at the Lying in Politics uh, mini-day conference that we had about three years ago uh, here at BART. So, so some of you have probably heard her before and we're thrilled that she's back. Uh, her books include Feminist Thinkers and the Demands of Femininity, The Lives and Work of Intellectual Women, and uh, W stands for Women, How the George W. Bush Presidency Shaped a New Politics of Gender, which she wrote with uh, Michelle Ferguson. And also Unmanly Citizens, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's and Germain de Steele's Subversive Women. Um, so she's uh, a, a prolific and, and very interesting thinker. We always enjoy having her here. Uh, today, it's, 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 it's great. She's going to be speaking uh, particularly about um, uh, Simone de Beauvoir and Hannah Arendt, Judgments in Dark Times, looking at two different uh, interesting, important 20th century women thinkers who've written about uh, war crimes trials coming out of the Holocaust. So this is uh, something that's incredibly appropriate for the Arendt Center for the Politics and the Humanities, and uh, I'm very happy to have Lori here. So she'll talk for about 10 to 15 minutes, Yes. and then we'll get to have our conversation, so thank you. Thanks very much, Roger. I want to thank Roger and also Verity for inviting me today. I'm really happy to be here. I've been working on this particular essay, actually, for some time, so I'm really interested in now getting some feedback from all of you, and that'll really help me to sharpen my, my argument. Um, so as Roger mentioned, in this essay I'm putting Beauvoir and Arendt in conversation about questions of judgment, and particularly about the kinds of crimes that threaten the human community, and particularly crimes that threaten political freedom. These two thinkers actually are rarely studied together, in spite of some common philosophical traditions from which they emerge. Um, and one one thing that I didn't put in the paper, for those of you who read it, but I wanted to mention today, is one of the reasons I think that they're not studied together very often is because Beauvoir is rarely thought about as a political thinker, actually. Um, and uh, this essay, maybe eventually, will be part of a larger book, which is why I started to write this essay, on Simone de Beauvoir's political thinking. Um, I actually edited a, a, a book of essays on Simone de Beauvoir's political thinking a few years ago. Um, but other than that book, there has not been any sustained attention to Beauvoir as a political thinker. Um, I think this is kind of a, a mystery uh, because she was engaged with so many of the important and dramatic political events of the 20th century. And she wrote about them quite extensively, actually. She didn't write about them in any one volume. Her work on these um, events is spread across a number of different kinds of, of essays and books uh, in many different genres. So she didn't promote herself as a political thinker, but in fact I'm arguing in this book that she is a political thinker, that she has important things to say about Stalin's crimes in the Soviet Union, about uh, the war crimes of, the, of Nazi Germany, and collaboration and resistance during the occupation of France. Um, about racism in America. She came to the United States and Richard Wright was her host here. Richard Wright and his partner Ellen Wright introduced her to the political situations in America and she became good friends with him and then when he emigrated to France she remained friends with him and also engaged with Fanon on questions of France's occupation of Algeria, and of course the women's movement as it emerged in France and the United States. All major political upheavals and questions 
of the 20th century, and she wrote about all of them, and yet she's not studied as a political thinker. The, the mystery deepens, actually, when we learn that she was actually engaged with all these political thinkers who saw themselves as political thinkers and were writing about politics. So, as I mentioned, Fanon, Jean-Paul Sartre, obviously, um, Richard Wright, Maurice Mer Merleau-Ponty in his book Humanism and Terror, and then someone, as I was studying Beauvoir in this context, thinking about her reactions to these political events, thinking about the conversations that she was having with all these political thinkers, I of course noted a startling absence, and that is that she was not engaged with conversations with art. Even though I noticed that she is reacting to some of the same events, writing about some of the same situations, and actually has some very similar instincts and, um, and analyzes events politically in some ways that I find have great resonance with Arendt's work. So this essay for me is an opportunity to put these two into conversation about these two trials and to think about the kinds of political concepts that emerge and the way of thinking politics for both of them and particularly for thinking about um, political crimes, the, the crimes that they name as new crimes of the 20th century. So again, I'm comparing this very well-known work of Hannah Arendt on Eichmann's trial in Jerusalem with this much lesser known writing of Simone de Beauvoir's on Robert Braziac's trial that took place in early 1945 in France. Um, both of these war criminals were executed by the Israeli and French states, respectively. And one thing that's interesting about when you read the two um, essays that Beauvoir and Arendt wrote about these trials, one thing that emerges right away as a similarity is that they both agreed with the death sentences for the criminals, but not for the reasons that were given by the court. So they name the crimes very differently than do the court. Um, partially because, of course, they're different kinds of crimes, but I also seek to argue in this essay that there's some kind of deeper difference at stake um, in describing what was specifically harmed by the actions of these war criminals. So I know that maybe most of you have read the paper, but just briefly in my um, ten minutes, I'll just tell you a little bit about Braziac, in case you didn't read the paper or don't know, um, if you're not as familiar with him, he was accused of treason and executed um, for treason by the French government in February of 1945. He was the editor of a fascist newspaper, Je suis Partout, from 1935 to 1943. Um, we are everywhere, and he published a column in this newspaper that revealed the location of many Jews in hiding. So this had a very um, dramatic effect of leading to Jewish loss of jobs, citizenship, and deportation. Eichmann is probably you're all familiar because his trial is much more well known. In fact, I think this coming month, April, is the 50th anniversary of the Eichmann trial. Um, he was employed by the Nazi state, the Information and Intelligence Department, and he was in charge of transporting Jews to their death. So Eichmann, unlike Braziac, claimed to have no racist feeling against Jews, he was just doing his duty. Um, and Arendt takes this argument of Eichmann's of doing his duty seriously to explore the individual's role in totalitarian states. Um, so the first thing that these two thinkers have in common is the criticisms, though, of the narratives that are being advanced by the national courts in their prosecution of both Eichmann and Braziac. So according to Arendt, the Israeli court was using the trial to educate young Jews about the need for a Zionist state. Um, likewise, France hoped to show that after the war, after occupation, that they could exert themselves as a strong state, punish collaborators, and um, show that they were willing to do this. And this effect of publishing, uh, the, the act of publishing collaborators, they also hoped would have the effect of, of 
making people think that most people were resistors, but that there were a few collaborators who we could single out, punish, and in this case, execute. So for both Art and Beauvoir, you find when you read these two essays that they wrote about the trials that the judgment that the courts delivered really missed the point. They thought, not the judgment that the courts delivered, I shouldn't say, that the, the way that they constructed the narrative about what those individuals were guilty of really missed the point and impaired justice. And so both argued that to judge the criminals, we must hold them responsible for specific deeds. Just as an aside, or maybe not as an aside because it was important to both of them, you should know that many arguments were advanced against this kind of justice, uh, judgment. Sorry. Some said that deeds of these individuals defied the possibility of human punishment. Some said that we too might have committed such crimes under similar circumstances, so how could we know what we would do under similar circumstances? Again, both thinkers were engaged in this project of trying to figure out when there's a state in place that is specifically targeting um, certain individuals, um, how, and it's actually legal for you to participate in those kinds of crimes, how do we know when individuals are responsible? And so some were arguing against just judgment by saying that we too might have commit those kinds of crimes under similar circumstance. Some claimed that these acts were part of larger forces of history. Of course, that was one of the arguments advanced by um, the Israeli court in the sense that they wanted to argue, argue that anti-Semitism is something that has always existed and will always exist, thus the need for the Zionist state, so on and so forth. And some, in sort of this more sympathetic <coughs> argument, would say that crimes never define the whole person. So against these kinds of voices, both are and both will make judgments that affirm that there is individual responsibility even within totalitarian, totalitarian states such as this, and we could surmise within something like police states, maybe not as dramatic as totalitarian states, but also states which are, are tempting you to take part and act badly. Um, so both cite this need to resist temptation. I find it actually interesting that they use that language of temptation in citing individual um, responsibility. So in Arendt's case, the judgment, of course, was controversial because of her discussion of leaders of the Jewish councils and especially also the banality of evil um, argument that she advanced about Eichmann, but particularly controversial was her argument about the Jewish councils. And in Beauvoir's case, this was controversial because she didn't sign a petition circulating that many of her intellectual comrades signed, um, which advocated clemency for Abraziak as a writer um, and as one of them, and for other reasons complicated. But in holding the individuals responsible, the two actually, and here's a big difference between the two of them, name the crime differently. So I wanted to talk about these similarities, now I'll talk just a little bit about the differences, which I think is more the heart of the argument. Um, Art focuses, of course, on Eichmann's inability to think, and particularly names his crime as a failure of this Kantian notion of representative thinking. He adopts the views of those around him, and as she put it, he fails to think from the other fellow's point of view. Um, Roger actually has a great collection of essays, Thinking in Dark Times, which you probably all know about, but exploring this whole concept of Eichmann's crime is a failure to think. Beauvoir differently theorizes Raziak's crime and also crimes like Eichmann's. Again, Raziak's crime is very different, right? He's the editor of a newspaper, he's fingering particular Jews, he's a fascist, um, and he subscribes to a fascist ideology, and he is a very fervent anti-Semite. So, his uh, justification for the crimes is also quite different. He takes responsibility for them He's at his trial and says, yes, I did this, I meant to do this, and I wanted to do this, and it's really too bad that, that the Nazis didn't win. Um, so they are very different kinds of crimes. Um, but nevertheless, Beauvoir um, thinks about Rassiak's crime in a larger context as well, and, and in including that kind of crime, the crime that she names as Braziak's, as well as a crime such as Eichmann's, 
both as a failure to embrace ambiguity. So she talks about not Eichmann specifically, because she didn't know of Eichmann in her book, The Ethics of Ambiguity, but she talks about crimes such as Eichmann's, naming this kind of this, the crime of the subman, also as a failure to embrace ambiguity. There are a few kind of components to this, this idea of ambiguity. I'll just speak for a couple more minutes, and so I'll just name what she says ambiguity entails. So to embrace ambiguity, she says we have to reject ideological, philosophical, moral, and religious systems that impose a predetermined meaning on the world. That's one component. We have to recognize our failure to control others and determine the future. We have to accept that others are like us, both subject and object at the same time. This is a fundamental component of ambiguity that I try to get to in talking about, later in the paper, the sense of embodiment of the victims. And we must act to assume our freedom by affirming the freedom of others. So it's a very intersubjective sense of the political collectivity. So I am arguing in this paper that the failure to embrace ambiguity is described by Beauvoir as the crime for both Eichmann, were she to talk about Eichmann, but she talks about uh, a figure like Eichmann, and for Braziac, better, I think, describes um, what is at stake in protecting political freedom and the structures that enable and enhance political freedom than does Arendt's focus on representative thinking and the failure of representative thinking having an effect on, a, a, a terrible effect on worldly plurality, in that plurality is harmed. So, she, in talking about these crimes such as Eichmann's, Bobo says that these actions demonstrate a refusal of ambiguity, a refusal of freedom, in that actors such as Eichmann and Braziak offer themselves up to movements and ideologies that excuse themselves from taking responsibility for their own choices, and also deny freedom to others. So to embrace freedom for Beauvoir, rather than engaging in representative thinking, one needs to take responsibility for one's actions in light of the fact that one's existence and freedom are always and inevitably linked to the existence and freedom of others. Um, so Braziac was guilty of a crime against ambiguity by assuming he could determine the meaning of the world through adherence to Nazism, by treating others as things, which is the precise language she uses, and denying the openness and inexhaustibility, frankly, of the future. Moreover, and here's where I think Beauvoir's argument more explicitly becomes a critique, an implicit it, a critique of Arendt, is that it's in the denial of ambiguity um, and not seeing others as free subjects, and rather reducing them to their political interpretation of embodiment, that for Beauvoir is the worst crime. And this is where she really talks about ambiguity as having an effect on worldly conditions of freedom. So Beauvoir thus brings embodiment and the political interpretation of embodiment directly into her argument in talking about the crime. And so she opens it up beyond the individual and the focus on representative thinking to the political conditions in which people act and the political conditions in which Achman, actions such as Eichmann's and Braziak have particularly tragic kind of consequences. So when Beauvoir posits ambiguity as constitutive of the human condition, she makes the conditions of judgment explicitly and always political as occurring within the context of unique and separate individuals who cannot and do not know necessarily the situations of others. And here again, she differs from Arendt's focus on representative, representative thinking. And yet, we have, she argues, we have a responsibility of collectively structuring political conditions such that the actions of those, such as Eichmann and Braziak, will not have the consequences that they do. So she pushes us, I think, to think about how the political interpretation of bodies in public spaces 
threatens the freedom and sometimes the lives of distinct individuals and erodes the conditions of collective freedom. And I think since I'm very clearly out of time, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, for those of you who read the paper, you know that in the last part I try, um, I engage more with Arendt in the human condition and Beauvoir in the ethics of ambiguity to try and tease out more specifically what is at stake in this naming of the crime as ambiguity and how it links up with political conditions of oppression. But I'll maybe leave that for the discussion or at least open it up to whatever we would like to Great. discuss. Thank you very much, Gloria. I, I have a rhetorical question sure. for you just to start it off. Um, you, you spoke a number of times about the crime of ambiguity. The crime against ambiguity. The crime against ambiguity, and for our end, the crime against representational thinking, or, or, or think representative yeah, thinking. thinking. Um, um, and, and I guess I, 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 my question is, why speak of those as crimes? Um, I mean, uh, the crime, one might say, is uh, for our end that you supported a policy of not wanting to share the earth with the Jewish people. Right. Uh, and for Beauvoir, it's publishing these anti-Semitic texts by Braziac and others. Uh, and that the, 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 the justification for, for, for holding people responsible right. is, uh, is, the, is the loss of ambiguity or the lack of representative thinking. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one, I mean, I don't. I, I guess I'm, one question is, if 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 lack of ambiguity is a crime, many of us are in trouble. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess what what what? How committed to you are, are are you to this idea of the crime against ambiguity and the crime against uh, representative thinking, or is you know? And, and, and do you want to? Why do you use that language? Yeah, that's a great question. I. Um, that doesn't really seem like a rhetorical question. That seems like a real question. <laughs> well, it's a question about rhetoric. Yeah, oh, I see. Rhetoric. Am I rhetoric? I, yes. I, I, okay. I'm, I'm just wondering why you call it, a, yeah. you know, why you call it a crime. It seems like a rhetorical move. It's very ambiguous. <laughs> <laughs> yes, actually, I've been struggling with that myself. I believe that I'm calling it a crime to distinguish it from, in Beauvoir's essay, for example, the crime of treason. So I named it as a crime in that sense, but that's a very powerful point. If it's a crime against ambiguity, then we're all guilty. Like even a crime against representat representative thinking, we are all guilty of that as well. But really what I wanted to, so I'm not very committed to saying that it's a crime, but I wanted to name specifically that there is something here that is being violated under these larger political conditions that lead to the kinds of actions that, um, that the kinds of results um, in the case of what happened with Eichmann's crime of, I guess, yeah, if you say Eichmann's crime is not wanting to share the world with others. Um, Participating in a, a, a policy of not wanting, of, of, of destroying a people right. because not wanting to share the world with them. That seems to be the crime. Right. And the crime for Beauvoir then would be publishing these particular right. texts. But even publishing these particular texts may not have had the same effect within different kinds of political conditions. So I'm trying to open it up a little bit in thinking about representational thinking and ambiguity to, particularly with Beauvoir, think about the larger political conditions and what our responsibility to ambiguity is collectively at the same time as individually. And certainly when they talk about the death penalty, when I rent justifies the death penalty for Eichmann, Beauvoir justifying the death penalty for Braziac, they're pretty specific, and you're right, that is when they name the crimes much more specifically. But when they talk more philosophically at what is at stake in the trial, there's a different kind of language, and you're right, I should be more careful about talking about that as the crime in the legal language. Right. Um, yeah. She does say right before the judgment, though, she does use the language of guilty of a failure to think, right? 
So she doesn't, she says the crime is that you don't want to share the world with others. Yeah. And so we shouldn't have to share the world with you. But she right before that, right? She says guilty or failure. I think she says guilty. I might be importing the word guilty just to make it better. But it, um, you know, but it. Thank I you. Don't, but I don't <laughs> no, but I think that she says guilty. I know she says failure she says to think. Failure, she says failure to think. But I, maybe I am like, appending guilty of a failure to think. But yeah. No, I mean, look at the failure seems to not be linked crime. to the question of yes. why you're defining politics and where you're right. drawing the line, right? And, and moving it towards the juridical language mm -hmm. and outside the moral language right. is, is helping your project to say she's right. a political thinker, thinker. Crime, not failure. Right. Yeah. It, right. I was a little perplexed at the beginning when you were describing um, why she wasn't taken as a political thinker. Well, it seemed to be a very narrow definition of politics, which would exclude her as a political thinker, right? That it, it, in your description, it was sort of um, yes. uh, events in the newspaper is what counts as political thinking. Whereas that is not and, my interpretation, no. but I do think, well, I mean, I think there's several reasons that Beauvoir hasn't been taken seriously as a political thinker. One is that the second sex has kind of eclipsed all um, thinking about Beauvoir's politics and her contribution. But that's not Absolutely it is. Right. But in terms of of the questions just around feminism, embodiment, social conditions, versus the explicitly kind of political conditions under which people exercise freedom and thinking about the movement of history, for example, I think that um, Yes, there is a kind of cordoning off of the political in that sense to talk about how her concepts of ambiguity, contingency, oppression, and freedom translate into uh, a thinking about political events that we read about in the newspaper. So, so yes, it's. I mean, I think of politics very expansively, but there's been this tendency to to not read Beauvoir as having anything to say about those more explicitly political questions of the 20th century. Does that answer your question? No, no, I was just thinking that's probably, that, that might be why you're using crime. Right. right. This, 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 um, we edge it towards um, something that's closer to the political, something more not the moral. Like right, avoid this. Right, moral, is it ethical language. Moral, ethical, therefore yes. just philosophical. Yes, 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 yes. But it's true that I don't, I mean, moving toward the juridical language is also, it goes against really what they're trying to do here, right, as well. They, they are trying to, I mean, it's kind of a double thing. They are, on the one hand, and this is very important to both of them, holding these two individuals responsible for specific deeds. And actually, Arendt, anyway, has a pretty conservative philosophy of law in that sense. Mm -hmm. Would you agree, Roger? In, in, in one sense, very conservative. Yes. On the other sense, Radical insofar as it jettisons mens rea, yes, uh, definitely from, intention, from yeah. an intention from the from, right. from the conditions for guilt. Yes. So depends how you understand conservative. Like, conservative in terms of really trying to narrow the definition of what he is guilty of. Um, Beauvoir too wants to hold Brazia guilty of this particular thing, and I think you're absolutely right about that. Um, Roger publishing these texts, but yet she opens it up into this language of ambiguity, um, which uh, maybe muddies the water a little bit in, um, in terms of whether or not, she certainly doesn't have that conservative impulse that Arendt does, even though she does want to hold the individual responsible for particular deeds. Her essay is much more open in trying to think of those larger questions. Say more about. Oh, go ahead. Let's say more. Let's say you you have these two. Forget the the crime question now for a second. Okay. And you have ambiguity and thinking. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and you were you wanted to suggest that while there's a lot of similarities, these two approaches are different. Mm -hmm. Um. It, there's also a way, I guess, one could think of them as similar, right? But they're, they're, they are but, similar. But, but so, so just say a little bit more about why, what you think one offers over the other, or what the main differences between ambiguity and thinking uh, are as 
the two different, I guess, it, either crimes, right. you know, or ways, the, or ways in which these <coughs> people, um, uh, the justifications for punishing them, despite their not having mens rea in a certain traditional sense. Mm -hmm. uh, well, there are many similarities, and when I first drafted this paper some months ago, I saw them as very similar. So I've been pushing myself to try and think about what actually are the differences. When I started with the similarities, there's very clearly striking similarities in this con this idea of Arendt's I notion of thinking as the inability to think of, for oneself, um, to, uh, to be able to, what she talks about in the life of the mind, for example, this conversation, whether or not you can live with yourself, if you commit this particular deed, so you're, you're thinking outside of and in contradiction to, or in distinction from, or in a critical perspective with the ideas that are available for you in society. So in that sense, and that is very similar to Beauvoir's conception of ambiguity as she articulates it in terms of, of really focusing on the fact that we are, as individuals and as a collectivity, fully responsible um, for making meaning in the world, which is, of course is always a failure, but of course there's never any predetermined meaning either. So I think there's a real similarity there. A difference, however, is, and I, I want to be able to think about this more, and maybe all of you can help me, is that I think in this adoption or borrowing from Kant's idea of enlarged thought, and representational thinking that um, that aren't engages with and thinking from the perspective of someone else and so much has been written about this. Does this mean that that you do it by yourself? Does it mean that you talk to others? Do you do it in conversation? How do you understand the position of others? Um, but that framework for understanding thinking that Arendt has, I believe, is very different than Beauvoir's conception of ambiguity, where she really thinks that we are each kind of trapped in our subjectivity um, and that the other is unknowable to us, fundamentally unknowable, and that what all we can do is recognize that they are uh, potentially and equally free as are we. Um, they are both interpreted in the world, see themselves as subject object, and that collectively we are responsible for conditions under which people can embrace this freedom in the political sphere. So I think that Beauvoir has this expansive notion of ambiguity that gets, if you're only comparing her with Arendt on this question of representative thinking, I think that Beauvoir is able to get to the conditions of politics more. Now if you put, if you compare her conception of ambiguity with Arendt in Eichmann, with Arendt on the human condition, I think that my argument can be made. I don't know if it's it's not perfect yet, but I'm trying to, to make this argument. But I, I'm not sure when you compare Beauvoir's argument on ambiguity with Arendt in The Origins Totalitarianism, for example, um, and her focus on larger political conditions there. But anyway, I hope I answered that a little bit. <coughs> So this discussion is making me think I might have misunderstood your argument a little. But so as I understood it when I read the paper, I thought you were arguing that uh, for Beauvoir, it's relevant that the actions that these people perform are as representatives of some other institution, whether it's a newspaper or a political regime. Whereas for Arendt, their role, their institutional role is not relevant to what's problematic about their actions. And so I thought that that was the sense in which for Beauvoir, the, the problem is really rooted um, in something institutional and political in a way that it, it isn't for a rent. That's but, fascinating. I actually had never thought of that. Um, whether their actions as representatives of institutions. So. Eichmann's actions as representative of the Nazi state, or Razi Yaks's representative as a writer or publisher of this newspaper. I wasn't thinking of 
that. I was actually I was actually talking solely about the individual's role outside their um, oh. being a representative of the institution. But what I did want to argue, and maybe didn't come across as well as I wanted it to, is that for Beauvoir, the way that these actions take place and the consequences they have, of course, she, like Arendt, thinks we can never know the consequences of our actions, and um, and that that is part of this this sense of responsibility in which we act in the world. But she, um, Beauvoir, talks more about the political conditions under which one acts, um, and so that we have a more of a, a collective responsibility to take that into account. So can I just follow up a little sure. on the earlier exchange then? So in the paper, you contrast um, you, you use the phrase political register with mm -hmm. me, the merely social, mm -hmm. which you attribute to a rent? Yes. So what is the difference? Exactly? So if both have consequences, collective consequences, mm -hmm. what makes one political as opposed to social? Or what do you mean by political conditions? Well, for... Uh, in that, I think that where I was talking about that in the essay, I was making a critical argument on behalf of Beauvoir's sense of ambiguity against Arendt's understanding of plurality mm -hmm. as it takes place in the political <laughs> sphere as she defines it in the human condition or on revolution, for example, where she is careful for good reason, I think, but then also sometimes uh, has these bad effects of not being able to see certain things. She's careful to cordon off the political as its own sphere of freedom and action. And it's only in the political sphere that we can really um, express ourselves in word and deed as a who, as she calls it, beyond the what of our being, which is... Uh, again, the what of our being is something we all have in common, but of course we are all distinct in that as well, because we are in different bodies um, and have different um, relationships to the private sphere. So we are distinct, but also then equal in our bodily needs, but what makes us equal in the political sphere is this notion that the social will never breach that barrier. And so Arendt clearly distinguishes the social and the political, or in human condition, labor, work, and action, and the realm of the action is the political sphere, whereas for Beauvoir, this, this notion of the political is much larger, much fuzzier, personal is political. Um, and so there's a political interpretation of embodiment, for example, that Beauvoir finds we have maybe a really hard time getting away from that disallows us, um, sometimes absolutely, from disclosing ourselves in, in words, word and deed in the political sphere. So Beauvoir has got an enhanced notion of the political or certainly does not draw the boundaries in the way that Arendt does. So what I wanted to argue was that um, Beauvoir's focus on embodiment and its political interpretation allows us to see <coughs> that in a way that Arendt's focus does not. So that's why I talked about the political register. Laura. Um, so I wanted to go back to a note that you ended on in your response to Roger's last question where you were saying that um, while you don't find a, a lot of, sort of reverberations of Beauvoir's understanding of ambiguity in Arendt's account of judgment, you do think that there might be some something to her account of politics or Arts. action. Yes. yes. And I mean, I actually, it struck me when you were um, laying out in, you know, in a bit more, uh, a, a more abbreviated form in your presentation of sort of what ambiguity entails for Beauvoir, that it actually seems to map in some interesting ways onto Arendt's critique of sovereignty. Mm -hmm. that if, you, if you want, you know, if freedom is what you want, then it's sovereignty that you must renounce. And so I guess I wonder whether from a Beauvoirian standpoint, there might be something interesting to be said about why it is that Arendt's critique of sovereignty doesn't make more of an, an impact on her, um, you know, either her understanding of Eichmann's crime or her, 
theorization of, of political judgment um, more generally. Um, for Arendt. For Arendt. Um, that sort of, and, but this sort of, then also from an Arendtian standpoint, I, I wonder why it is that for Beauvoir, at least on your account, it sounds like judgment and action are almost indistinguishable. Um, for Beauvoir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that, um, I'm losing my train of thought a bit, but the, the, it seems like there might be something important at stake in keeping those separate. Um, and, and not just, you know, important being able to... judgment and action separate? Yeah, to be able to understand judgment differently than action. Mm -hmm. um, and, not, and then not only keeping... So I guess my question comes down not only to should we be holding judgment and action separately, what, are the, what do we lose either way, conflating mm -hmm. them or separating them? But then also there, you often invoke a language of um, acknowledging or mm -hmm. um, recognizing mm -hmm. ambiguity as the... As the Standard for mm -hmm. a good judgment slash action mm -hmm. in the Ryan sense, and so is that is that acknowledgement or um, sort of making manifest of one's appreciation of ambiguity itself folded into this action judgment conglomerate, or is that at a separate stage? So right. I'm saying like right. like is it is wearing the button that makes it more visible that. You're acknowledging ambiguity in your actions. What do you mean by wearing the button? Um, you know, sort of uh, making explicit that that you know that other people desire freedom. Oh, right. Versus okay. acting in a way that actually appears quite ambiguous, requires some interpretation to figure out um, whether uh, respect for others' desire for freedom is at stake in that action is enough. Okay. Sort of acknowledgement in the, I don't know, the way that Taylor talks about it, Charles Taylor, mm -hmm. when he's talking about the politics of multiculturalism, mm -hmm. where it's just important to make it more explicit. Is that what you're calling for, like a sort of more explicit um, confession of one's awareness of the ambiguity? Or, and if not, what would it mean to kind of acknowledge ambiguity in an, in an action versus not acknowledge it, other than just sort of saying it out loud? Right. There was a lot in that question. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, no, that's good. I, I, I try and take it on, um, but Laura, you tell me if I'm losing part of it. I, so Feel free I, to lose as much of it as you want. <laughs> the, the question about Arendt's critique of sovereignty and why doesn't that make it more into this account of, of Eichmann or even, um, even that first sense of, of thinking, which... Um, is about the Socrates two and one, you know, as she talks about in the life of the mind. That is a kind of a critique of sovereignty, but yet it's a it's a individual, <laughs> isolated position from which one thinks. So I, it's always been a mystery to me, I guess, because I love Arendt's critique of sovereignty, and I have not quite figured out why it doesn't figure in more um, in that account. Um, and other than that to say, yeah, I, I guess I, I'm not quite sure, and I'd and I like to explore that more. Um, but Beauvoir's position on sovereignty, just to, to think about that for a moment in relationship to Arendt's, is also complex because she certainly thinks as our actions as taking place um, in conditions of non-sovereignty. So in the same way that Arendt talks about in the human condition about um, how we don't have ultimate control over the interpretation of our actions and we can never know until after the fact what they really meant or any meaning that they have um, and we don't control like uh, our perception of ourselves and so on and so forth. But what also uses that language to talk about conditions of um, political conditions in which she uses more of a subject-object language, mm -hmm. right, than Arendt, but to talk about how the subject never has sovereignty over one's perception of your embodiment, of who you are, so on and so forth. So the critique of non-sovereignty is clearly very important to Beauvoir. Um, there is no sense, though, in recognizing, acknowledging ambiguity when I use that language 
I wasn't um, thinking about it in the tailored sense at all, actually, um, and I don't think that Beauvoir would, his theory would fit with that sense of, of, of an acknowledgement or recognition of ambiguity. Um, I'm thinking of it more in terms of political actions. What does it mean to recognize our ambiguity and non-sovereignty and act in a way that is consistent with that recognition means to engage in political actions that explicitly alter political conditions such that they will enhance the freedom of others in an intersubjective space. Um, what does that entail? I don't know. But um, it's, that is her political sort of impulse there um, that goes, I think, beyond the sort of the ethical or the language of identity. So are you arguing that her judgment of Brasiak is an example of such a judgment that in ambiguity in that sense? Is that the, is that the argument? Yes. Um, first, I just want to tack on to this last thing about sovereignty just quickly, and then I have a couple other questions. Um, I have just a hunch about that, that, and I haven't worked this out yet, because obviously it's just, just a rose. It's so interesting. But I have a hunch that one reason that Arendt might have felt constrained in using a critique of sovereignty um, and I, I mean, she does critique the Israeli state and yes. you know, Zionism along the lines of sovereignty, right? The assertion of sovereignty in Eichmann. But in What is Freedom, in the essay, right, in which she most extensively critiques um, sovereignty, in which Laura was citing, she's very, very concerned, and in On Revolution as well, she's very concerned to dismantle Rousseau and Rousseau's notion of will. And she compares it there to Kant's notion of will and says Kant's notion of will is an interiorized version of Rousseau's exteriorized. You know, which makes sense intellectually, historically too, but version of will as sovereign. And so she's binding will up with sovereignty, and there she's blaming Kant, along with Rousseau, for doing just sort of the inverse version of the, you know, a solipsistic inverse version. So I don't, so maybe she just didn't feel that, um, you know, she could render that critique of sovereignty, of national sovereignty, along. Right. Um, the, you know, and, and recuperate Kant's notion of will. She drew on a different part of Kant. I don't know, just a hunch, I'm not sure. Um, but I guess my main question was, I was thinking about um, your comments about, um, I mean, your emphasis on ambiguity. And that I think what seems to be problematic for Beauvoir in offending ambiguity or failing to acknowledge ambiguity, um, it may be that it prevents reciprocity, right? I mean, it prevents... And in second sex, that's the problem as well, right? That if you don't have, enough, you know, as, as it is in Ethics of Ambiguity and elsewhere, if you don't acknowledge someone else as a subject, if they're only an object to you, mm -hmm. um, then you can't be recognized, right? If there's no reciprocity, then you can't be recognized as a full subject either, and so you're not free. Mm -hmm. And so this concept of reciprocity seemed um, important in the sense that the parallel in Arendt is concept is plural, you know, is plurality. Mm -hmm. and so I wondered, you know, in terms of trying to think about ambiguity versus thinking, you know, and the role of the individual, the <coughs> failure of the individual to acknowledge ambiguity on the one hand or to think on the other, whether it would be helpful to kind of try to parse the differences between reciprocity <coughs> and sure. plurality, right? Instead of just kind of folding. Um, reciprocity into plurality, mm -hmm. you know, and thinking of them in the same way, because they're, they're different and kind of paired concepts, it seems to me. Yeah. Um, and then second, yeah, just are, a quick comment. Okay. Okay. Let's, we'll, okay. we'll just right. let her answer one. Or okay. Um, the other thing was just a comment, so go ahead. That's really helpful, Verity. I like that idea of reciprocity. I have um, not, I never used the word reciprocity in this paper, right? And I, I'm not certain how I feel about reciprocity as the language that Beauvoir is really engaged with. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think that it is. Um, certainly in something like um, The Second Sex, there's, she talks much more about ambiguity actually mm -hmm. than reciprocity because she thinks that you can also 
make yourself sometimes into an object and you're both subject and object at the same time rather than it being a subject-subject relationship or a subject-object relationship. It's much more I'm subject-object and you're subject-object. And that's why the language of ambiguity is maybe a little distinct from the language of reciprocity. That's, yeah. So I didn't use that language quite deliberately because I'm not sure if that's the best language to characterize what O was doing. That's interesting because that's related to the comment I was going to make actually, which is that um, you know you were thinking about well, you know how to what degree does Arendt's use of Kant kind of shape what she calls the crime? And I was thinking then, of course, well, to what degree does Beauvoir's kind of neo-Hegelian framework shape mm -hmm. the way you know Contra a Kantian mm -hmm. one shape the way in which she names the crime? And mm -hmm. obviously, the desire to read Beauvoir as concerning reciprocity is partly. A desire to read her as a Hegel. And she's right? not. So I, yeah. She's so certainly yeah. highly so influenced like by Hegel, yeah. but I don't think that she's yeah. doing a Hegelian thing. Right. So I think it's different. And that's why I didn't use the language of reciprocity, even though uh -huh. it's a nice comparison. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't think, for me, I, like I, I resist it because I'm trying to figure out how is ambiguity different from reciprocity mm -hmm. and how do we understand ambiguity Politically, how does that? What 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 happens there when we think about it beyond the relationship between two individuals? And that's why Brasiak is an interesting case because um, she does expand it into the political terrain, of the larger. That's great, Stephen. Um, I guess this is sort of returning to the difference between um, embracing ambiguity and thinking. Mm -hmm. um, so if if I decide that I don't want to be a criminal. And so I devote myself to thinking in the Arendtian sense. And my roommate decides that he wants to not be a criminal, and so he decides to embrace ambiguity in um, following Beauvoir. Like, what What would be the difference? How would we act differently? How, how would... What am I missing that, that right. he has in his, in his understanding of... I think only for Beauvoir, what she would say you're, you're doing the thinking, right? Yeah. She would say what you're missing is that um, you actually can't really engage representative thinking. She doesn't really think that that is possible, so she certainly wouldn't want to put all her marbles in that basket for protecting our communal lives. So that's one thing that she might think that you're missing. Um, maybe that's the only thing, because there are, there are very clear similarities in that if you're thinking and your roommate or friend is engaging in ambiguity, you are, you are thinking for yourselves, you're taking responsibility in the world, you're thinking about the situations of others, how you're thinking about the situations of others is a, is a difference, um, but you're, you're taking certain kinds of similar ethical, making certain, certain kinds of similar ethical moves. Um, I, get, I guess how does, then, how does representational thinking, maybe I, maybe I just don't, I'm not familiar no, with that vocabulary, yeah. but um, representational thinking does that um, does that require me being able to actually access your experience somehow? Well, that's or, or a great can question. I, or can yeah. it just be? Can it just be in my thinking? I'm I'm realizing that you are a subject that's separate from mm -hmm. from me. Like how? Right. Because then that seems very similar to, to respecting, to to respecting your subject object. Yeah. And that's a conversation that is ongoing in the art literature. What really does she mean by representative thinking? Um, and do, how does someone make themselves present um, to me? And how do I understand that? The one thing that ambiguity adds, again, that I'm trying to flesh out a little in the article, uh, the essay is that it makes you think more explicitly about embodiment. So in my response to Verity's question, this kind of 
subject object, that we're all subject objects, and that we are also always politically interpreted right. in our embodied in our, in our embodiment. So it opens it up onto what Arndt would call the social. So there is that distinction as well. I should have yeah. mentioned. Yeah. But in terms, just in terms of the ethical questions, you know, I think that there's. You've pinpointed it, and it, and it really hinges on that. What does it mean to do representative thinking? Yeah. Maybe that in itself is um, recognizing ambiguity. Yeah, yeah, I guess that was my question. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, Sorry, question. I'm muttering. But um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it does hinge on, on how you understand rep representational thinking, and, right. and how um, probably which part of Kant you Mm -hmm. Tie that back into what kind of what what goes with enlarged mentality, etc. Right. Um, and I just thought what you seem to be pointing to as the specificity of Beauvoir would be always taking into account that if we're sub if they're true subject objects, you mm -hmm. know, there's sort of at least four possible mm -hmm. relations. Mm -hmm. um, but and it sounded as though you were sort of saying, well, that doesn't happen in representational thinking. It's much simpler than that. Um, I'm not quite sure whether you would say one always thinks the other as an object. Probably not. No, as I an don't object, think so. And yeah. they're certainly both. I mean, you can find both strands in. in um, I, I, I just sorry, just a phrase of Kant. You have to want for the other not what you would want for them, but what they would want for themselves. For themselves. Mm -hmm. That that seems awfully close to making the attempt to think. Sure. Yes. Subject to subject. No, that's a very good point. And where I'm taking um, Arendt's yeah, concept of representative freedom. thinking is from her lectures on Kant's critique of judgment. And um, and again, there would be much more intellectual work I could do just on that. But that's a really good point to try and think about um, being more specific on how that works as distinct from ambiguity, and then particularly the question of why for Arendt, and again, I think it's just so complicated, and I'm not quite there yet in order to be able to fully explain this, why for Arendt then embodiment cannot come into the question, right? Um, because for her, it just doesn't. Um, and there are all kinds of reasons that she lays out in On Revolution and the New Condition and so on and so forth. But how is that linked up? Why would that embodiment, political interpretation of embodiment, not come into representative thinking? I would think that it would. Um, even in her um, essay on Reflections on Little Rock, it, embodiment comes into it, really, in a way. I mean, she wants to keep the the sphere of the social separate from the sphere of the political and talk about um, political legislation as the solution to um, school integration or school segregation and so on and so forth such that these battles aren't out on the playground or whatever. But she starts off the essay by saying, well, when I read about this case, I thought, what would I do if I were a black mother? And then I thought, what would I do if I were a white mother? So she is kind of explicitly thinking embodiment there. I think she comes up with the wrong answer both times, but that is interesting as a kind of thinking embodiment in representative thinking. So I'm just arguing against myself here. But I'm trying to understand maybe a little bit this relationship between representative thinking and why ambiguity captures embodiment better, which is the argument that I would I'm entertaining for the moment, um, and seeing if that works. Yeah, I'm. I'm a little bit unclear about what is what Beauvoir thinks is like is distinctive about Rosalia's crime in comparison with. Like it would seem to me that this idea of of violating or putting ambiguity in the sense that you think that you somehow have the the right or the, even the ability to like to destroy them, how that is. How is that not present any time violent you someone commits a violent act against against another human being? Uh, this, this idea of turning a human being into a thing. Like, what is new about that about that idea of ambiguity? So, do, your question is, what is new about Braziac's crime? Yeah, for Beauvoir, what's what's different about this that's different from like a, any violence against another person? Does that make sense? Like yes, yes, very much so. Um, what's new about it, I think in the context of her writing uh, in 
in the trials is that there was explicitly in place laws that made that not against the law. Um, and he was engaging in that. And, and this brings the question of embodiment back into it, targeting individual Jews literally only by naming them in the newspaper. So his crime, like, like for Eichmann um, with Arendt, Beauvoir had the, the difficulty maybe of making the case that though neither of these two individuals actually murdered anyone, or um, laid their hands on anyone, or um, even gave orders to kill anyone, yet, and they were part of larger political institutions in which they were acting, and there were no legal mechanisms to hold them guilty, um, nevertheless, they were guilty of these particular crimes. And when she names Braziak's crime, it's very controversial because after all, he was just a writer. Um, and he was, he, we, we could even say that, his, that it was just free speech. He didn't actually do anything. Um, so he treated them as things only within the context of a political situation where the consequence of fingering those Jews was rounding them up and deporting them. Does that answer your question yes. at all? I think so. So, and he acted, Beauvoir says, acted as if he could control the future, as if the Nazis would win, that that was the vision of the, of the future that was true and good, um, and that he then was individually responsible even within that kind of larger system. I can't, oh, sorry. No, no, no. Okay, I just wanted to tackle something that I think is kind of inherently problematic about the concept of an eye for an eye. Mm -hmm. um, and the Beauvoir says, on, you have it on page 13, death is the only penalty that can express the violence with which society refuses certain crimes. Right. Um, and it's interesting for me because it sort of sounds like, I mean, like, the ideal, the ideology of like fascism, which is death is the only penalty that can express the violence with which um, our ideology refuses certain things or certain human beings. Right. Or, and um, right. So I guess I, it's something that I'm interested in is is crime a thing or is crime an action or does crime like is crime an action that becomes a thing so that we can target it? I suppose I, I don't know. I just. I'm really glad you brought that up because um, it allows me to talk a little bit about that quote. Um, and the reason that she justifies the death penalty is out of this notion of political solidarity. She says, so I can um, either sign this petition, she's talking specifically about why she didn't sign this petition for clemency. She says, I can either sign this petition and um, side with Braziak. Or I can sign this position, this or I cannot sign this petition, and and side with his victims in solidarity, and that is what she decides to do. And you're right when she says death is the only penalty that expresses the violence with those with which society refuses certain crimes. She is also talking about a notion of solidarity and a world we want to build and a world that we want to build which um, is a world which enhances the freedom for everyone. It's very controversial. I mean, Beauvoir had links to the Communist Party and her politics were controversial and, you know, there's this whole question of how can you defend treating others as objects because Beauvoir will do that, mm -hmm. right? In saying that she is for the death penalty, she is denying ambiguity, really, because it's treating Braziak as a thing who can be eliminated in her vision of the future. Um, and she's got a controversial defense of that, which is that her vision of the future opens up freedom um, for all. So it is a very political defense, and it's a very controversial defense. But again, like in my response to Verity's question about subject-object and whether this was Hegelian, um, uh, Beauvoir is 
talking about, she's willing to say that sometimes, different than Arendt, she's, she's willing to justify violence too. Um, you know, Arendt, Arendt justifies the death penalty for Eichmann, but Beauvoir will justify violence. She just justifies violence in revolutions. She justifies violence in political movements. And she, and she says we live in a world where we do make people into objects and things. We do. And how do we decide when that is justified and when it's not? Um, and that's why I wanted to say that for her, the question of judgment is always at the center of politics. Again, maybe going back to Laura's point, how is it distinguished from freedom and action? Those are things that I should think more about the specifics of judgment, the specifics of freedom, the specifics of action, but certainly um, when we're um, having to act in the world and sometimes act in which we treat others as objects, we are making judgments in order to enhance freedom. So, in a sense, she's not really, I don't know, uh, in a sense, ambiguity is like a really good uh, term for her to use because she doesn't have very straightforward political ideas. Um, well, it's not. She's not like ever kind of diverging from one point because she's ambiguous. So she's kind of like hiding on maybe this label of ambiguity. Well, again, that's a good point. I I think that she thinks that then we are all hiding because no ideology can. Um, encompass our relationships to each other and the responsibility that we have for them. Um, and so though, again, she was sympathetic with the Communist Party, she doesn't say that communism is the answer, which is why her work on Stalin is actually really fascinating and the problems that it raised for her and, and thinking about, um, about what, for her, the French left in the second half of the 20th century, what do we support? <laughs> um, and how do we remake the world in light of these horrible crimes? Uh, she does maybe have very ambiguous responses, as you put it, but she wouldn't put it in that, that negative light. Um, I didn't intend to Right, okay. Negative. But I just wanted to, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That was a good question. I'm um, probably running close to time, so let me ask a, a last question. Um, and it comes back to these last couple of questions. You, you described Arendt's, I mean, uh, Beauvoir's uh, effort as a kind of creating a solidarity. Mm -hmm. um, and you say it was a solidarity with the victims as opposed to Braziac, right? It was a choice that she made. Right. Um, whereas Arendt is very critical of this, the idea of solidarity with the victims and, and making a judge. She, she sees that as vengeful. Mm -hmm. But there's a different idea of solidarity in Arendt's writing, which is that Arendt says that in making a judgment of someone like Eichmann, mm -hmm. um, we don't think of solidarity with the victims, mm -hmm. and we don't think of um, really about uh, Eichmann's will. Can we, can we be solid, have a solidarity with his mens rea or his will or right. what he did? But simply with the world in which deeds like he did can be done. Can we, she says, reconcile ourselves to living in a world where such deeds were done? Mm -hmm. Or can we not? Mm -hmm. And if we can, we judge him not guilty, mm -hmm. which only means that we affirm solidarity with the world mm -hmm. in which such deeds could be done. Mm -hmm. And if we can't, we don't even say, we, we say he's guilty, and we say that we have to erase him from the world so that the world can be reconstituted as a world in which something like that didn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, this is the sort of idea of non-reconciliation that she brings in, mm -hmm. in this work. And um, to, to be to look at that... Non-reconciliation and not reconciling with that kind with, of world. With that world. Mm -hmm. Now that's a very political reading mm -hmm. of her judgment of life. It is. And I guess what I'm suggesting is maybe the comparison in thinking of them as two political, you know, two political responses is not to think of Arendt's response as one of the crime of not thinking. Right. But of the question of, in her mind, can I have solidarity with a world with Eichmann in it? Mm -hmm. 
and in Beauvoir's mind, the need for solidarity with the victims. Two very different ideas of politics. One is solidarity with victims and those who are oppressed, and one is an attention to a common world. That is the presupposition for political activity in general. And that might be a different way of, of, of thinking about um, of these two these two different judgments of politics. Actually, I, I really like that. I think that's a very interesting way of thinking of it. And I like this notion of non-reconciliation with the world. And I think that's a, for me, that's an accurate way of thinking of why aren't justified the death penalty for Eichmann. And it is, as you're saying, a very political um, judgment, but very different from Beauvoir's solidarity with the oppressed. So just even bringing that out a little bit in terms of that difference um, would be very helpful. I like that. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, please join me in thanking Lori for coming to talk to us.